Hello and welcome to episode 200 of The Entrepreneurial Musician. I am your host, Andrew Hitz, and I cannot believe it that I made it to episode 200, and that is all because of you, all of my Patreon patrons, all of my listeners, everyone who subscribed, left a rating, a review, told a friend. You guys are the best, and I took an entire episode in 199, which was very creatively titled, Thank You, to tell you how much all of this has meant to me and to kind of look back at the last 100, which I did on TEM 100, was looking at the first 100. And so I won't take a ton of time, but I would be remiss if I did not repeat that message one more time for the actual 200th episode. You guys are amazing. Uh, I love you all. Thank you so much for supporting me and just for being there for me. Thank you. It really means a lot. I could not have got a better guest for this round of a number. Angela Beeching, as you are about to hear, is just phenomenal. As I say at the very end, and I say this to her in the interview, it is very rare that any person can be as good at the big picture conceptual stuff as well as the small actionable advice stuff. And she... It's just, it's amazing how she blends those two things. You are going to absolutely love this conversation with her. We continued it in the bonus episode, which will be available to Patreon patrons next week. It's, she's just, this is a very special human, and I'm so glad that she joined me for this interview. I think you're going to love it. I need to take a second to thank Parker Mouthpieces for providing the hosting for TEM. Parker Mouthpieces offers fine, customizable component mouthpieces for horn, trombone, euphonium, and tuba, including the Andrew Hits Artist Model Tuba Mouthpiece. You can find out more at parkermouthpieces.com or follow them on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Also, as I just did, a shout out to everyone who has gone to patreon.com slash TEM podcast. There is an extra TEM episode every week that you can go and listen to all of the back catalog for that, as well as the, the monthly TEM report where I talk about how I am doing as an entrepreneur and about the successes I'm having, the failures, the confusion, all of that stuff. And it's a way for me to stay honest, but also for you to get a behind the scenes look on one person and all of the irons that I have in the fire. It's it's really it's a it's a healthy process for me. And I've gotten a lot of really great feedback from a Patreon patron. So you can find out more about that. Uh, at patreon.com slash TEM podcast. And thank you to everyone who has left that rating and a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to TEM. That always helps the algorithm. And uh, yeah, again, you guys are the best. I really, really appreciate it. I had no idea I was going to be here for 200 episodes. That is one heck of a run. And I'm still getting a lot out of this. And I I'm, don't have any plans on stopping anytime soon. So Without further ado, let's get to the incredibly empowering conversation that I had for episode 200 with Angela Beeching. And today for episode 200 of The Entrepreneurial Musician, I am joined by a very special guest who I was very excited to receive an email from this woman uh, about, I don't know, a month and a half ago or so, and she had been on my list. I know that I have said that that I like has been on my list. I mean it though. Like I I've said that probably like 10 times, but every one of those people has been on my list for a long time. There's just a lot of people. Uh, and so when, uh, when Angela Beeching, who you are about to hear say hello, uh, reached out, I was like, I'm getting close to 200 and you're an incredibly important person in this field. And so you would be a good guest for number 200. How would you like that? And I got back an all caps response. So, uh, so Angela, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, you're very welcome. It's great to be here, Andrew. Yeah, this is this is going to be a lot of fun. So Angela is the author of a book that was quite revolutionary when it came out and is still, even if she had not updated it, which you're about to hear, uh, in fact, this release date is going to be right around when the book comes out. I mean, so it's it's in pre-order right now as we are talking um, towards the in the middle of November. What is the release date? It's December 12th or something like that? Um, on on Amazon, it's December twenty third, and I think okay. Oxford is offers it a little bit earlier. But 
Still in time for Santa. Yes. Well, and so when <laughs> this airs, you you can buy this for pre-sale, which is always really good for the algorithm likes it when the book is sold before it's even released, and then you just get it while you sleep uh, when it's uh, when it releases in the middle of the night. Her book is called Beyond Talent, and the third edition is about to come out. And uh, again, it's really great to have you, Angela. Oh, thank you, Andrew. So great she, first of all, she wrote a textbook email of pitching herself for being on the podcast and Angela Beeching does not need to write a textbook email for getting onto the podcast she could just have written some slightly more polite version of I'm Angela Beeching and I'm a big deal and I'm willing to be on your podcast <laughs> so tell me when it's going to be and again you can't be that direct but she could have done like a slightly you know like prettied up version of that and I would have said absolutely but she talked about specifically about TEM she thanked me for it she referenced a specific episode she then said I think that I that your audience would appreciate and then she listed five topics of which we could do an entire episode on any of the five because she obviously did her homework and figured out what, you know what what the audience is looking for um, and then said but if I'm not a good fit I totally understand and I appreciate your putting this out into the world and I was like you did not need to do that I told I showed my wife that email as soon as I got it and she was like wow that's amazing <laughs> so the five topics that she wrote I, I always rag on people who are who are sending bad emails so I I just wanted to like I like to really compliment and, and point out exactly that people like you do it right so um so th isn't it sad that that's rare that I need to actually like point out the fact that you wrote a thoughtful pitch email well I think we all learn by doing things crappy the first time so, I, amen yeah, to that yeah, yeah. and that is yeah. going to segue perfectly into the first <laughs> bullet point that she sent me as a possible topic which is self-promotion and so a lot of artists can struggle with this can you uh, get us started on a topic about um, about self-promotion and embracing it and maybe how we can execute it yeah yeah thanks it's um I know it's everybody's favorite thing to hate. Um, Self-promotion makes so many of us feel really uncomfortable because it brings up all of our self-esteem gremlins, all of those fears about not being good enough and all of that comfortable stuff that we try to push away and pretend that someday someone else is gonna take care of all of this for us. Hmm. But I have to say, in working with musicians over the years, this fascinating thing happens. Um, and it often happens when we're working on bios. That's like the place where you have to like come clean about who you really are. <laughs> when it's done, when it's done well, you know, as opposed to the usual um, grocery list of everything we've ever uh, <clears throat> done was, in our life and you know, all that boring stuff. I was so. born at a very young age. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> And, and that all just comes from scarcity thinking. We feel like we have to prove ourselves and that we're not good enough unless we have, you know, 18 lines of stuff. So I just have to say, it doesn't matter what level someone is at in their career, how many accolades they have, how much they've done. When it comes to working on self-promotion materials, most musicians feel less than. Hmm. It's just that our egos take a beating in that whole process. But the fascinating thing for me happens in working with people and getting them to actually tell stories about who they really are, about the, how they got started in music, what, what was the thing that motivated them, what kind of set their mind on fire around music. <clears throat> when you get people talking about that, and then you can capture bits of that in the bio. And it starts to feel like a real person. That's the time when their promotional materials actually start to connect with people. Right. And when also when the musician herself or himself starts to feel at home with their own packaging. Hmm. And that's just a that's just a huge benefit because I've seen people actually feel more confident because of it. And this affects how they network it affects how they move forward it affects actually performance levels because you start to really um, ground yourself in who you really are you're not trying to put on some kind of show for somebody wow 
Yeah, you're just trying to be yourself as an artist, which you had a spark to be in the first place. And uh, yeah, the 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 only thing that you by definition have uh, quote unquote over me is that you are you, right? And likewise, what I have over you, and I just mean over, I, I put in quotes just because mm-hmm. it means like, that's what's remarkable about me relative to you and, and vice versa. And and so it's mm-hmm. it's literally not like a she's Angela Beeching and I am 25 and I have a part-time job, which fills me with shame because I can't support myself playing the flute or whatever, right? It's that you have something that Angela doesn't have, which is that you are yeah. you and you have your – all of it, the good, the bad, everything. And it's great that you encourage people to to bring that to the surface. Yeah, I find I find it's really it's a challenge. Most of us have to sort of like peeling an onion, try to get down to okay, who am I really? And it's a it's a big deal for people to get there. I thought starting out doing this kind of work, I wouldn't have thought that there's like this spiritual element to this about claiming your actual power. <laughs> But that thing about your artistry, how can you bring that forward if you're not willing to to be real with people? Wow. Yeah, claiming your artistry. So, okay, so let's say that someone is listening to this and that they uh, can't uh, – let's, let's just say that they can't hire you as a coach for whatever reason. Um, and mm-hmm. by the way, I will put a plug in for getting a coach like Angela, someone that does things like hers, that we all spend so much money on guitar lessons and on tuba lessons and on composition lessons. And then we don't spend any time getting a coach on all of this stuff, which it's like, it's crazy how there could be such a disparity between so much money and literally none. But let's say other than getting someone who can really help you specifically, what do you tell that person uh, that's listening to this, like what are the first steps that they can take to claiming their artistry? Yeah. So the the thing that I usually do with clients is to ask them to start by making a list, not not using their old bio, not, not looking at their resume, but making a, a list in column form of all the items that they think might go into this bio. Hmm. And of course, you're going to think about, yeah, there's these venues where I perform. There's these people that I collaborated with, you know, whatever. You're going to put awards and degrees and all of that stuff. But you're also going to think about, okay, what's not been in my bio in the past? And what what stories are there about me? How have people described my performances, my sound, any of that? And instead of um, the, the mistake that most people make is they it before they've even got the compost heap going so but the list is really just that compost heap right. of like going back down you know memory lane and and not editing just listing once you got this big long list of stuff it's easier to sort of clump things by categories what makes sense so let's say you've premiered a lot of new works or um, you do a lot of early music. And so there's sort of a, a set of credits that you want to talk about. Um, you, you, you put those together into mini paragraphs is what I would say, just a sentence or two. And you might think, okay, for an outside reader, what of all of these credits are going to be most interesting? Instead of saying to yourself, okay, I haven't played Carnegie Hall. I've got nothing. <laughs> Instead of saying that, right. say to yourself, okay, what's the most interesting range of places where I've performed? And what's the interesting, most interesting range of repertoire right. that I've plan- performed? Not just the standard stuff that everybody will list, but what's at the corners of your repertoire? Hmm. And um, I think when people start doing this, they get like lines or two. You're not trying to make beautiful sentences. You're not trying to write paragraphs. You're just trying to get the content and figure out what is the story that I'm telling here. Um, And a bunch of blog posts on this, but there's this one um, exercise when it comes to actually writing more of the story aspect of this, that you can imagine that you're having coffee with a a favorite relative who's not a musician and you're catching up Hmm. and let's say it's an aunt who's visiting you know from out of town she's going to come and hear a performance 
and she asks you a couple of questions and you're not going to talk down to her or dismiss her because you actually love this woman. And I, I, I want to try and, you know, get this across. And she might ask you, okay, what, what, I don't remember. How did you get started in music? What, what is it you love about it? And what's a upcoming project you're especially excited about? And so how you answer those things might end up material for the bio. So sometimes people are so um, constipated by the idea of writing, like it just right. cramps them up, that, that the easiest way to do it is just record it on your phone, record how you would respond. Wow. And I've had people use quotes, you know, quotes, quote themselves this when they're really talking about why they make music. Hmm. And it's wonderful because it's going to be as different from one person to the next. So you start to really get a sense of the individual. Wow. That some of that and true wisdom can frequently seem so painfully obvious right after you hear it. <laughs> but, but, uh, you know, it's, of course, not everyone is as comfortable writing. And so, well, who says that you have to write a bio? Who says that that's the whole creative process is that you sit, you write, you edit, and then you share. Like, you know, the fact that you're, that you're doing a role play thing or even just that you're speaking it and just telling, literally telling a story. Uh, that That's great. Yeah, that's, uh, and I'm sure that unlocks, um, yeah, my brain's racing here in a good way. I mean, I, I've been very spoiled in the music business and my in my opportunities and my bio is is filled. Again, I've just been so lucky with a, a lot of quote unquote important stuff, right? I, I have no problems filling it out with lots of places and uh, you know and ensembles I've played with and all that. But that's not what defines me. I mean, that's not right. what uh, that's what's quote unquote impressive, I guess. You know, I mean, if you're like if you're playing that game which you never win on Facebook or on Instagram, but that's not what defines me as an artist. And so that that's um, that's really interesting that you've that you've uh, nurtured a process to actually get to the bottom of that, whether you've done a lot of things quote unquote or not. Um, yeah, that, that's great. Yeah, I think it's just like Simon Sinek's thing that people really just want to know your why. Yes. Yeah. And and once they can sort of see that there's a real person there, much more likely to click play because a bio is just a call to action to get us to take that to, to make that move. Yeah, so. yeah, that that's uh, that's really great. Uh, Ari Herstand, who I uh, you haven't heard this yet because it hasn't even been released yet, but it will have been by the time anyone hears this. Uh -huh. He was episode one ninety seven, and uh, and he shared that um, that the most recent stat he heard was that there are um, there are forty thousand songs a day uploaded to Spotify. Whoa! <laughs> right? Whoa! Yeah, I mean, and there's not forty thousand uh, classical flute songs you know i mean like whatever your corner of yeah. this is but it's but yeah it's all about um yeah and the internet is just you know there used to be that cartoon like sorry you've got to the end of the internet you know turn around and go back it's like <laughs> it doesn't exist right it doesn't you can just keep reading and so for me to take to stumble on your bio and then say i want to hear about angela's art yeah. i want to i want to i want to actually consume some of that art that's like that's hard to get that jump yeah so yeah. and what you're describing that i bet we'll do it that that's the other thing is when you do run into somebody's promotional materials that that strike you it's not just you're reading it as a musician and just comparing like what is what has this person done but when there's something there that really piques your curiosity i always tell people save that like keep a folder for mm. those things because learning and in, instead of comparing yourself to someone else and again beating yourself up and having it be an ego game Instead, just take a look. Okay, what really grabbed me in this? Right. What What is just that little bit of analysis can help people so much with their own materials? Yeah, boy, we we all spend so much time. If you're a singer songwriter, it's like you listen to the great the, the singer songwriters that scream at you over and over and over again and learn from it. And same thing with classical tuba players or whatever. But then, like when we go to write a bio, yeah. I'd, I've never thought to like keep a file of uh, you know of things that really strike me so that I can then go back. It's not like if a recording like screams at you that you never listen to it ever again. <laughs> you know, it's like you yeah. yeah, you keep going back to it. So, yeah, that's that's more uh 
Love it. Actionable advice. This is why you're here for number 200. I was like, I was hoping you were going to hold up to the pressure (laughs) of being the 200th episode. I thought I had to. Yeah, I was thinking I had to tap dance or do something extra special. Oh, so. there's there's still time, Angela. There's still time. <laughs> I got work on it. That would be so. quite audacious if I waited until we were actually <laughs> recording to tell you, by the way, I need you to tap dance. So the <laughs> So uh, that's that's great. Uh, that's great news. So wh- what do you tell someone who's who's like just hung up on self promoting? I think that there can be this this uh, I think mm. very um, ill conceived notion that if your art is just that good that you shouldn't have to promote at all. What do you say to someone who maybe doesn't feel that it's not binary, but maybe there's a little bit of that that creeps in when yeah. they have to start doing it? What? How do you address yeah. that? I think everybody has that. Everybody has a little bit of like revulsion with this and aversion to it. Mm -hmm. And um, in the end, you know, I I always say, yeah, if you want to just make music in the practice room, great. You don't, you don't need to promote. Right. If, if you did this, if you got involved in this because you want to share this with people you have to care about them. Mm. You have to actually get out there and, and figure out how to connect with them because you're offering something of value. Hmm. And that thing that's going to speak for you, um, that people are going to encounter first, it, it's probably your photo, your bio, something before they encounter your music. It's, it's, that stuff is the ambassador to your art. And so it needs to, it needs to introduce somebody appropriately, and it needs to be convincing and and uh, be an extension of who you are as an artist. So yeah, it's worth it's worth caring about. The other thing, you know, like there's typically this kind of fake um, dialectic between the art and the business between art and money it's a fight that so often we're in our in our minds or in some part of our our being we're not comfortable with these two things sitting side by side right they help each other right um that that's the uh the the just bizarre thing it's it's of course you you need the money you need the promotion you need the audience in order to that part of it is obvious but maybe it's not so obvious that nine times out of 10, when I, when I'm working with, with clients and they've got an issue around finding more time for their art, more time in the practice room and just resenting the hell out of anything they have to do on the business side. Right. Talking about it is, okay, how can I take more control of, my time so that the time that I have in the practice room really pays off that I am doing the best that I can there. So there's this thing that these two sides help each other because when you get more in control of your finances, of your time, of your attention, it's going to help the artistry. Right. It's just, it's so weird that this, that we have, thought of we've tried to compartmentalize things that actually aren't so separate Hmm. there you go if you uh like me maybe are a tuba player and did not know what dialectic means i looked it up for for you i mean i knew what it meant just in case anyone else didn't it's uh the it's the art of investigating or discussing the truth of opinions or inquiry into metaphysical contradictions and their solutions i mean obviously that's what she meant so <laughs> yeah, just a quiz word in there along with the tap dance. No, it's good. It's good. No, I I um yeah, there's nothing more off-putting than people that use big words when it's really clear that they just want you to know that they use big words, but like <laughs> But because of Google, I looked that up right away. And so I was like, it was your next sentence. And I already knew what it meant. I was like, that was the perfect word to use there. I just didn't happen to know what that meant. So uh, there you go. So I play the tuba pretty well, which is good. So, you know, it's like I'm a racehorse. I just keep turning left. So, yeah. So um, so uh, let's move on to the um, – to the next topic that you sent me, uh, which was uh, managing entrepreneurial projects. I 
I, I've had a lot of success with that, and I've struggled and continue to struggle a lot with that. And so I, I feel like I, what I'm about to hear from you, I should probably compensate you for. But um, but I'm not going to, unless you tap dance, that I'm not going to actually <laughs> PayPal you any money. So okay, but, it's a deal. Yeah, let's uh, let's hear uh, let's hear. See, I gave yeah. you an out. See how gracious I am. Okay. Um, yep. Yeah. So uh, what are what are your thoughts? It can be very hard to manage entrepreneurial projects, especially when they don't yeah. have an end date. Uh, there can be a lot yeah. of wiggle room there, and then the fear can kind of take over when you don't even know that it's fear and it's complicated. So can you help us unpack this? Yeah. Yeah. I have to say most people, most people have dreams of a project or sometimes 17 projects. Yeah. Right. They never get started. They never, you know, they never get to go on those things because real life and everything else that's, that's pulling at us gets in the way. Right. So for everybody listening, I just want to say it's so common for musicians to have like a, a dream project that they are too afraid to even tell somebody else that mm. they would like to do this thing. And it is an entrepreneurial project because it's something that demands their initiative. It's something that no one else is asking them to do. It's something that they would have to create. So easy to let years and years go by and to end up being some bitter, middle-aged, cranky person um, who, you know, it's a woulda, coulda, shoulda thing. Right. right? And so that can even there, happen when you've got a quote unquote real college teaching job. That can happen when yep. you have a, a good tenured symphony orchestra position and this is not just someone who's failed at yeah. music whatever and it's never binary but failed at music and is now in middle management in some company that they don't even know what they do yeah 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 and it's just it's such a shame because <clears throat> nobody wants to get to be 80 90 and be looking back and think i wished i had a i wished i'd done this right plug for getting started and getting started <clears throat> usually involves just talking to somebody you have to start somewhere and the fear shows up immediately right the fear of even naming this thing of 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 saying oh my god this is too audacious i could never do this right and we talk ourselves out because we say out of it because we say it's too much money too much time i don't have the right contacts um, I don't know what I'm doing. You know, I'm not ready, right? And the truth is, you're never ready. Right. Never feeling, but but you could be willing to start talking with people and take that first step. Mm. So that the thing that happens then, even when people do take that first step, is they get intimidated by the amount of work, and they don't know where to start, and they feel like if I start here. I'm saying no to this other thing and I'm going to be screwing this up and I have to make it perfect. And it's not about getting it perfect. It's about getting it going. That thing about um, doing some brainstorming, maybe with a few friends, a couple of mentors, whoever you've got, and making a list of action items. And I have to say, like Seth Godin would say, it doesn't matter what you start. It's just you start with one of those because it is going to reveal to you next steps. Right. And uh, I use this thing called the productivity planner. I'm, you know, now addicted to it. It's one of those, um, you know, journals, but it forces you to choose the the one most important thing that you need to do that day. So every day you're, you're asking yourself, okay, what's the scariest thing that's on my list that I know in my heart of hearts really needs to be done. Hmm. If I can interject here, I think that that uh, productivity then, planner, that's the thing that you wrote about on your blog that you had it suggested over and over by people that you really respected yeah. and then you bought it and it was this beautiful book. And then you like never, I mean, you were like, and it even, I, the, I yeah. love it. This was just say, her blog, which she mentioned before, and I was going to mention this later, but I'll mention it now. <laughs> it's incredible. It's really, 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 she could just, she could publish another book and charge money for it. Um, it's great. But she talks in this post about how she got the book and then she was putting it off because she was, it turned out that she was afraid to actually to commit to the important yeah. thing each day. And it even got onto your to-do list multiple times, right? To like, yeah. 
to yeah. actually to write something in the book. And then that kind of filled you with more fear because you kept on. And then finally, yeah. and now you're saying that you're addicted <laughs> to it. And it's just great that when someone who has accomplished as much as you yeah. have and who helps other people deal with this very thing can still fall for the trap. Yeah, it's you're not dealing with fear, whoever you are listening to this. It's yeah. all of us, me, yeah. Angela, you, everybody. Yeah. It's just how to how you deal with it. And it's not about getting it perfect. It's about getting it going. Mm -hmm. I almost just like yeah. ran a lap around my office here. That's that's awesome. Yeah, that's really. So yeah. anyway, you can tell us more about that. But I wanted to that that context oh, I think yeah. is really powerful. Yes, yeah, seven months. I had that damn book <laughs> seven months before I started because and the thing I was telling myself is because there's like 12 pages, 12 little pages you have to read at the beginning just to get the hang of it. Right. I said, oh, I don't have time for that. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, Two, 200 consecutive days that you didn't have time to read 12 pages. I, right. Yeah. Right. And, and exactly. you actually didn't have time to read 12 pages. You just never made it. Right. I mean, I doubt that you're ever right. exactly. that you're ever not intentionally relaxing, but that you're just like, I, I want to get something done. And I can't think of a single thing that I need to do. Like, right. When's the last? <laughs> time that happened were you like 12 probably i mean right yeah yeah yeah, yeah. fear yeah. is uh man fear is a hell of a drug no, that, and it's not a good one yeah yeah no and it and it and it stops too many of us yeah i think all of us from from doing that and that thing about various thing in the day um uh, if you get in the habit of doing that you're proving to yourself I am the kind of person who can do the scary stuff. Right. And that is how you're going to get that entrepreneurial project done. Because whether it comes to comes down to raising money or finding partners, um, getting outside of your comfort zone with promoting, promoting the the um the product or whatever you're you're creating, all of that stuff is scary. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, the sooner the sooner you you get on it, the better. Um, now, but you asked about managing projects, so usually things get out of hand really quickly. Right. Too many tasks, not enough delegation, not enough help. I find the 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 thing that is really common among the musicians that I've worked with is the fear of asking for help. Right. So even even just to connect with couple of colleagues say, how have you solved this problem? A lot of people just don't want to go there because they don't want to uh, come across as someone who is needy in any way. Right. But that's crazy because yeah. we all have needs of and course. we can all help each other. Of course. So, yeah, of course. Yeah. Uh, so uh, Seth Godin, who you mentioned, he, um, yep. he said uh, for projects, he thinks that each Slack um, that that every project, if you're on mm -hmm. Slack, that he recommends that each project have a its own channel. It needs two things. It has its own Slack channel, and it also has an end date, for better or worse. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. this thing is done on March 1st, whether we, like, we say, we were going to write a book, Angela, and there is no book, and we are done, or... We've got a book, you know, um, yeah. which I think is is kind of cool. Um, and, yeah. and everybody works differently. Uh, but then the other thought I had, which I have not even uh, downloaded it yet, but uh, Basecamp is another Slack-like project management mm -hmm. tool, which they just announced three days ago that they have a free version of that for basically huh. for solo for soloists for people just like you and me and so yeah. if you have a huge team uh, then you have to use the paid version but I've heard really great things about specifically because there are to-do lists and there are assignments and like so it's very clear who is doing what in there and so that might nice. be something that you want to look at unless you're yeah. going to use investigating that as an excuse to not get started because it's not about getting it perfect. <laughs> a wise woman yeah. once told me it's not about getting it perfect. <laughs> it's about getting it going. So Right, right. Um, well, that's only me me echoing my business coach. So, but, yeah. <laughs> see? Yeah. And uh, there's so another it, it there's another around. plug for coaches, right? Yep, this yeah. coach. I mean, yeah, you're you do it full time and you have a coach. <laughs> so, it's kind of yeah. like 
in music, I mean, I, 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 um, I attend a lot of, well, I used to, before I, I had a kid, I attended a lot of master classes and I would take copious mm-hmm. notes. This was when I had been in Boston Brass for a dozen years and I was just mm-hmm. like banging out quotes and I would then put them up on my website, which would then like, so I'd have to get them right. And by the time I heard it, typed it and then put it up and edited it, it was like really kind of integrated into my playing and into my teaching, which was really, really good for me. It's now not as often, but, uh, you know, in, in music in general, we like, you know, you take lessons up to a certain point, then you get a gig, certainly in the classical world, mm-hmm. and then you stop taking lessons, right? I mean, like most yeah. people in the Boston Symphony are not showing up for their weekly violin lesson when they are getting paid 90 grand to play the violin. Um, yeah. So, um, but yeah, but the coaching thing, because it's such a bigger topic than just playing the mm-hmm. classical violin, like all of this stuff, fear and and mindset and project management and all of this stuff. And so it's pretty cool to hear that you, that you have a coach yourself. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. And I, <clears throat> I hear what you mean about people once they've got the gig to, to sort of think that their education is done. Right. Is a real mistake. Yes. Because everybody needs some uh, like prodding to push them even further. Right. I just mean a, like a like a different perspective, mm-hmm. um, a different, you know, some other influences. I think many professionals are starved for this kind of input. Yeah. And again, they feel I, I've, I have a, um, a former violin uh, violinist client in an orchestra, and she was shy about asking her stand partner, the concertmaster, to hear her play for a, for a few, you know, she just wanted some feedback. Right. And she, and, and it was awkward because she wasn't asking for lessons and the, her stand partner didn't want to be um, giving a lesson in this situation with a colleague. So that it was something they had to sort of work through, hmm. but that feedback, like honest and, and generous, not just, you know, you're fine, you're fine, you're fine. But, Good word. You know, here's yeah. something to think about. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, sure. If it is solicited and and yeah, and and I could give you something which I think would actually make the manuscript of your third edition a little better, then I'm being selfish by not telling you. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I yeah. Mean, yep. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh and well, and that kind of circles back nicely to when you were talking about the self-promotion, about how sharing your art is actually caring for the people who are meant to consume it in the first place, right? Mm-hmm. And, and about how if you keep it to yourself, then that's not doing as good a job of caring for those people yeah. as you can, because we need art more than we've ever needed it, I would say. I mean, like, we just yeah. desperately need it. And so if you've got art, share it. Yeah, share it. Right. Yeah, it's it's it just sort of underscores this larger viewpoint that we're not doing this alone. We're not doing it for ourselves. Right. <clears throat> we're, we're part of a much larger community. Right. And when you, when you start to, when you just keep that in mind, then it's easier to network. It's, it's easier to feel good about, about being kind um, about reaching out for help, about helping others. I just think it's a it's a much better way to go through this. Yeah, yeah, it is. Well, I could keep you for another few hours, but this has been uh, <laughs> this has been really good. I uh, I think that it is it's rare when there is a person, and I I knew you from reputation that this was going to be how you what you were like, but I think it's rare when someone can talk about such uh, broad topics while still being so grounded in reality and offering like actionable advice. I think it's easy to talk about like broad things and which is important, you know, but, but when you can do that while simultaneously, um, yeah, while simultaneously offering specific things to do, I think that's kind of next level. So I, I know I very much appreciate uh, everything that you're putting out into the world. So thank you for that. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Andrew. And uh, that is going to do it for another episode of The Entrepreneurial Musician. You've been listening to The Entrepreneurial Musician with Andrew Hitz on the Pedal Note Media Podcast Network. We are at TEM Podcast on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. 
Head to andrewhits.com slash TEM to learn how TEM Consulting can help you make more money in the music business. You can support the show as well as gain access to bonus material like the monthly TEM report, free consultations, and patron-only hangouts by donating as little as $1 per episode. Go to patreon.com slash TEM podcast to join the listeners who have already become patrons of TEM on Patreon. The theme music was performed by Ben Barron, Rich Kelly, Daniel LaPell, and Andrew Hitz. The Entrepreneurial Musician is produced by Andrew Hitz. This has been a presentation of the Pedal Note Media Podcast Network.